Well, if I could just give you some background of the views that I've expressed in the past, which is that I think that a hard Brexit uh, for Gibraltar is in the short, medium, well, in the short term it would have been chaotic, and in the medium and long term it would be socially and economically disadvantageous, and that I have thought that Gibraltar should try and have welcomed government agreements uh, during the transition in the first place and now in the, re in the context of the uh, future relationship agreement. Uh, I have welcomed attempts by the government to um, come to agreements with Spain following the EU's decision to give Spain a veto on the extent to which future relationship agreements could apply to us. So from that day, we knew that if we wanted to avoid a hard Brexit, we had to do agreements with Spain of some sort or another. Uh, and, uh, and I believe that it is sensible and right for Gibraltar if we are to avoid a hard Brexit, in other words, being left out of the physical space of Europe, economically and in mobility terms, in personal movement terms, it's important to try. And therefore, I welcome, firstly, that the transition period has ended without a precipice, without a hard Brexit on the 1st of January, which would have been that short-term immediate chaos that I described. Uh, and, and I'm also very pleased that this six-month space has been created uh, to try and avoid the problems in the medium and long term of a hard Brexit by arriving at agreements uh, with Spain uh, that avoid it. And there's plenty of scope for local agreements and things of that sort that will deliver that. You have mentioned there uh, the importance of avoiding a hard Brexit, but you have talked about an agreement with Spain, of course, uh, being the country that neighbours uh, uh, Gibraltar. But how significant is it that what is being worked towards is a, with the EU, and B, that it be a treaty? Well, take the second one first. I think it's crucial that it should be a treaty. I, at the time of the God of War agreements, I did political agreements. There was no, Gibraltar had no urgent pressing needs, or we benefited hugely from getting freedom of our telephone numbering plans. It allowed the gaming industry to boom, uh, and lots of other problems went away. But uh, there was no life or death, so to speak, in, of importance. Need They were politically motivated uh, initiatives. Um, and you, we know what's happened to those uh, when there has been a change of government in Spain. Because they were only political agreements, a, a future political government in Spain of a different political colour was free effectively to tear them up and ignore them. Uh, they can't do that with a treaty because a treaty becomes international law and therefore it is important that whatever happens, happens in a form that emerges as law, international law, and therefore cannot be tampered by the next right-wing uh, government in Spain, especially if it has Vox uh, participation, which would almost certainly take a hard line on Gibraltar. So important, very important, that it should take the form of a treaty. And that it be with the EU? We know that the EU will not agree to any treaty in relation to Gibraltar's uh, participation in uh, future relationship agreement uh, re regimes that avoid hard Brexit uh, unless Spain has agreed because that is what they gave Spain at the time of Brexit, your viewers will recall. So, yes, treaty, we've got to get Spain's agreement to it, because of their veto, effectively, and therefore we've got to do the negotiations with Spain. But I think it is equally positive that if a treaty can emerge, if an agreement for the detail of that treaty can be negotiated and agreed, that's what the next six months will show, that it should be a treaty between the UK and uh, the European Union as part of the um, uh, panoply of treaties governing the UK's future relationship with the EU, because this debilateralizes it as between us and Spain or the UK and Spain, and it becomes part of the body of law that governs the relationship, the legal relationship between the UK, including Gibraltar now, and the, and the EU. So it's Im very important that it should be a treaty. First of all, it's very positive that the government should be trying to achieve it. Secondly, it's very important that it should be a treaty. And thirdly, it's very good news that if it, one can be agreed, that it should be between the UK and the EU. So that would make it the last point in particular, or, or maybe generally, the fact that it's not bilateral and the fact that it is a treaty would make it 
how immune or how bulletproof do you think it would make it from a change in government in Madrid? But look, nothing is forever, even if it's part of international law, because very few international treaties are done. In fact, I'm not sure that it's legally possible to do an international treaty that cannot be terminate. They usually contain termination provisions. Um, so if this were a treaty with only Spain, there would be some sort of termination provision. Indeed, we might want there to be termination provisions in case we grew not to be able to live with the content of the agreement with the passage of time. So there would be termination arrangements of some sort. If it was an agreement with Spain, those termination provisions which usually involve giving a period of notice, uh, would be in the hands of the Spanish government of that day. Um, and therefore, the fact that it's an agree a treaty with the EU makes it less vulnerable to that, because then all 27 countries would have to agree. Um, well, at least by qualified majority. If it's a treaty with the EU, it's not an intergovernmental agreement. A qualified majority would suffice, probably. But still, it would need a preponderance of EU governments uh, to want to disrupt these arrangements, and, and that makes it much harder. So it's not set in stone forever in either case, but it's certainly less set in stone if it's with the EU and with Spain. As somebody who oversaw Gibraltar's economic development over the course of 16 years, what is the significance of this, or what could be the significance of this agreement in principle, and moreover the treaty should it be achieved in ensuring or assisting Gibraltar to develop um, economically yeah. outside of the EU now? Well, that's the core question. I mean, that's, that's why it's important, I think, for Gibraltar to try. Um, when I say try, I don't mean try at any cost. I mean, there is, there is a cost to not doing agreements of this sort. There is a cost to Gibraltar of hard Brexit, borders that can be made as impossible as the Spanish government of the day, whoever it is, may decide to make them. That in turn has impact on our economic attractiveness as a location for business, gaming companies and many other tourist visits, the quality of life of Gibraltar and the free flow of goods and services and people that we've all now got used to and on which our economy is increasingly based. All that would suffer to some degree, even in the hands of a favorable Spanish government, in the hands of a hostile Spanish government, it would be the sort of political weaponry that I don't need to explain to the people of Gibraltar. We've all lived it at first, at first hand. So it's worth exploring. That's the prize. The prize is to avoid that. Okay, so that's the mobility of people, but what about goods and uh, the possibility of a customs union? Well, it remains to be seen what the scope is of the uh, issues that they're discussing in the context of a possible agreement. That, that needs to be clarified in due course by the government. But uh, I think the real key issue is mobility of people, which means uh, the ease with which the frontier can be closed. And we've uh, I've explained to you why I think a treaty is important, namely that it shouldn't be, we shouldn't be at the mercy of a change of Spanish government in the future. And of course, we wouldn't be achieving that if we could get through the passport control, or better said, there is no passport control, but then there is a customs control in Spain at which they could just as easily cause the queues. So if what drives us is mobility, and the important thing to Gibraltar is the fluidity of the frontier, then there is some logic, isn't there, for uh, removal of both the control of people, the passports, and the control of goods, uh, the customs. Otherwise, they could stop you at one or the other, whichever of the two survives. Uh, so uh, it may be that that is under discussion. If it is under discussion, that might be part of the price. In other words, at the moment, we have, uh, we're outside of this customs union and we're completely free to, uh, uh, on, on indirect taxes. If we had to form part of the Union, of the Common Customs Union, to achieve that objective, then there would be consequences of that, and the government's got to weigh those up in the context of uh, the economic cost to us. But I think it's a discussion worth having. I'm sure the government will, will consult with business and businessmen and, 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 and come to a conclusion. But in principle, my personal view is, that if we don't do something about goods then uh, and a, a customs control check remains, 
then the main gain for doing anything at all, namely frontier fluid, guaranteed frontier fluidity, goes away. And that begs the question, well, then why pay any price for that if you're not getting the advantages of it? Because the disadvantage can be inflicted on you anyway at the customs post. Now, you don't get a valuable prize for nothing. At the very least, you've got to buy a raffle ticket if you want to buy it with the first prize in the, in the draw. So everything comes at a price. Acceptable to the people of Gibraltar? That think? is what remains to be seen. Uh, obviously, the government will know, not just from their own political convictions, but because they know what the people of Gibraltar think. The government will have an idea of what Gibraltar will bear by way of price for this prize and what it won't. And it may be that if uh, the Spanish government adopted a very hard line, um, which hitherto does not appear to be their position, they're being sensible and reasonable and fair about this, uh, worth just commenting here that when the UK, uh, when Spain entered the EU, the UK did not take advantage of Spain's situation to extract a pound of flesh from Spain. Um, and I think it would be reciprocity if they did not seek to do the same <laughs> or the opposite uh, when the UK is leaving. But anyway, that, that is an aside. We can, just, we can just only a, hope. A, just a side comment. <laughs> uh, so the... Uh, it remains to be seen, and, and we all have a shrewd idea now. I think the chief minister has said enough about the nature of these discussions public for us all to know, that the key issue for Gibraltar is nobility, it's cross frontier fluidity. Effectively, we had to reduce it just to one issue, and everything flows from that, and that the solution, probably the only solution that exists for the EU and the UK to do something that allows the EU to carry on more or less as it is at the moment, uh, is uh, related to the Schengen uh, area and how do you make Gibraltar part of the Schengen space if our internationally sponsoring nation, the UK, is not itself part of the Schengen Agreement because they never have been and certainly mm -hmm. now they're not and they wouldn't be. Um, that immediately raises the specter of, well, who is our neighbour? Spain, that is the logical candidate to fulfill the role, so now we get all this, these concerns being raised about mm, Spain being ultimately responsible for Gibraltar in the Schengen space for compliance with the rules and the Chief Minister clarifying a different interpretation of that. I think that is the territory, because I think people in Gibraltar have red lines, uh, probably most of us would draw them in more or less the same place. I think we would all find it terribly, terribly difficult. Um, not to say impossible to accept Spanish physical presence in Gibraltar, Spanish officials doing this or that in Gibraltar. Uh, but the Schengen Agreement and the European Union uh, Code and the fact that the treaty is between the European Union and the UK uh, does create space for uh, that area to be the subject of agreement of the sort that the people of Gibraltar could very easily find acceptable. Not in a way that concedes nothing, because as I say, nobody gets anything of value for nothing. So certainly, given the political, um, the seismic change that there has been in the landscape of Europe, political landscape of Europe, and with it, our situation in it, via via the UK and the rest of Europe, uh, I think people have got to understand that the the, the rules of the game have changed a little bit against us uh, and that we now have to contemplate things without crossing red lines that we wouldn't, that we would prefer, in an ideal world we would prefer not to have to do at all, but actually we are sensible and we stand back and we see this is the prize and the opposite of the prize is suffering the consequences of a hard Brexit forever. Mm -hmm right, at the board economic. So uh, um, given the consequences of that, this really is a price worth paying, however much in an ideal world we may not enjoy it, but it doesn't cross our red lines because it doesn't give Spain a role in Gibraltar. It doesn't uh, give Spain any stake in our sovereignty or in the jurisdiction or in the control of Gibraltar's affairs. So, and that is the line that the government I'm sure will, is going to be steering in carefully in the next six months to see if um, an agreement can be reached that is delivers a price that Gibraltar can pay. Uh, and if they fail, then so be it. But it's right to try. I think the government have got to be trusted, in my view, 
and given this political space without being badgered to explain things publicly, the biggest enemy of the successful negotiation of political agreements, and it is in Gibraltar's interest for such an agreement to be struck, the biggest enemy of that is having to explain things publicly before an agreement is done and then uh, the, the position is made difficult usually for your opponent because your opponent's domestic political opponents will come crashing in on him and deprive him of the ability of their political space mm -hmm. to do a deal with you that might be favorable to you. And, and that it's important, therefore, there is an element of trust. You know, there are people in Gibraltar who support the, this government. There are people in Gibraltar who don't support the. But I think this, uh, this issue transcends party politics. We're all in the same boat together. Ultimately, Gibraltar PLC, whether you're a GSD voter within it or a GSLP voter within it, we all have the same interests in Gibraltar being protected from certain um, uh, unhelpful things. And we have the government of the day, and therefore we must all stand behind them and make it as easy as possible for them to come to an agreement. We will have time later to evaluate the agreement. I'm sure the government will uh, explain it when they're safely able to do so. Uh, and we will all have the opportunity to decide whether it's a doable or not a doable agreement. And finally, Sir Peter, we've heard uh, uh, Sir Joe Bosano talk about the architecture of the airport um, and the role that that could play uh, in allowing an office uh, that straddles the frontier uh, to be a part of the solution. Any comments to make in respect of that? Uh, well, I could make lots of comments, but the one that comes to mind immediately right now is that I'd be delighted if our airport agreement uh, airport, uh, uh, concepts and the building that was delivered in order to uh, uh, bring it into play, it, it now provides a solution that assists in whatever the government is negotiating with Spain. Uh, if it does, that would be wonderful.